This is the Memory Palace. I'm Nate DeMeo. He would build a shrine to an idea. That was the idea. Or a shrine to ideas, that may have been it. Maybe the vigorous debate of ideas? Ideals with an L, certainly. Intentions are hard to divine when you look back. So maybe it's best to start at the beginning. Walter Knott had nothing. He lived out in the San Bernardino Valley, east of L.A. His father died when he was little, and his mother did what she could. She was industrious. Her own parents had come out west in an honest-to-God-covered wagon. But there was only so much she could do on her own. So young Walter pitched in. There was an empty lot near his school. He was eight or nine, so this is like 1899. And Walter planted a garden there, tended it before and after school, and then sold the vegetables that sprouted up through the dirt. Took some of that money, rented out other plots and other empty lots, unused corners of neighbors' yards, grew more vegetables, made more money. And when he got older and married his high school sweetheart, they moved out to the Mojave Desert, built a house, and started working the land. Didn't get much out of the land, so he took a second job. But while other men were trying to pull the last threads of silver out of the long defunct mines that had put that part of California on the map, Walter took a gig changing that map, ushering in a new era for California, working on the road crew that laid out what would become Route 66. Now back home, where his wife continued to work the land, if you worked that land for three years, the federal government would just give it to you. That's the way it worked back then. So Walter Knott went from nothing to owning a 170-acre safety net as he took the road west and tried his luck in Orange County. He started growing berries on another rented plot in a town called Buena Park, sold them in a stand by the road, took a chance and bought the land. And so he had something, had a leg up on the other farmers in the area when the Depression hit and, and they couldn't make their own rent. And as the big farms in the area grew, and as a new road took folks to the coast, that road went by Knott's Fruit Stand. He started selling chicken dinners. It was the perfect place to stop, halfway between the beach and the city. And his wife could cook. And people kept coming back, told their friends about the nice spot on Beach Boulevard in Buena Park. Nice people, a good meal, berry pies for dessert. And then there were lines, people waiting forever for four hours on a holiday weekend. Not figured he'd give them something to look at while they waited to be seated. So he made a garden of rocks and ferns, converted an old tractor engine into a pump, made a working waterfall. Then he put his collection of music boxes on display, built a beehive and put it behind glass so he could watch them buzz about. Kids like that. Started a grandfather clock collection. Grandfather clock enthusiasts, I guess, like that. And then there was more. There was always more, more tables, more attractions. Not like the Old West. So he sent a fellow out to the desert with a truck and some cash to buy up every old barn, every busted up blacksmith shop. Find him one of those doors, the, the kind that swings open when an outlaw comes into the saloon looking for trouble. And by the early 50s, Knott had a full-on amusement park. There were stage shows and shops and some simple rides. Walt Disney would come by sometimes when he was planning his own park in Anaheim up the road. But even Disneyland didn't slow Knott down a bit. He was making money hand over fist even though admission was free. The restaurant was still churning out chicken dinners. He sold souvenirs, fake Native American pottery, tickets to a train you could ride through a mine made of concrete poured into chicken wire and molded to look like boulders and stalactites and Knott's Berry Farm, Walter Knott's Amusement Park. And Knott's Berry Farm, Walter Knott's Farm of Berries, made him a fortune and a prominent man in a thriving community there between the city and the sea. When he would think back in his life, as he wandered the grounds of his living legacy, there in the 1960s. He would tell a tale of the American dream, of a self-made man who had nothing, who had to sell vegetables as a boy to be able to afford bootstraps with which to pull himself up, who built an empire one nickel berry basket, one fried chicken plate, one more ride around the ersatz mine shaft at a time, built it with nothing but his bare hands and innate ingenuity, in an enterprising spirit he traced back to his pioneer forebears and to the vision of the founding fathers themselves. And the story was true, more or less. He wouldn't dwell much on the 170 acres he got from the federal government or, or that he was born at the right time in the right place with the right skin color to get those acres. But sure, a tip of the hat to Mr. Nod. Why not? 
But as he walked among the crowds posing for Polaroids in front of the old saloon, or throwing Roosevelt dimes in the old wishing well, he didn't like what he saw. It wasn't the park. He loved his park. It was the people. There was something wrong with these Americans. Something lazy and entitled. And when he'd go home to his ranch house, right there attached to the restaurant where it all began, and he'd see the news from Birmingham or Little Rock, see these protests, see people clamoring for civil rights, handouts, he thought, this wasn't those people's fault. The laziness, the entitlement, It was the government's. A government that had strayed so far from its animating purpose. It had bound its citizenry in chains of taxation and dependency. It had kneecapped businesses by allowing workers to organize, by forcing them to pay a minimum wage, dragged them down with regulations that protected, and he certainly would have put protected in air quotes if air quotes were a thing back then, that protected employees and customers in the environment. Civil rights legislation infringed on his civil rights. Just about any legislation, when he got down to it, was a menace to American freedom and a corruption of the Founders' vision. And if that sounds familiar, sounds like a distilled form of American conservatism circa now, thank, or not, Walter Knott, who had a lot to do with it, who started a foundation that made a couple thousand short documentaries that railed with equal fervor against communist nations for murdering dissidents and his own nation for making people get building permits and stuff. Who gave many of his millions to conservative causes and candidates, enough to make sure they were conservative enough for Walter Knott, who helped fund the rise of Barry Goldwater in 64, who worked tirelessly to get Nixon, Orange County's own in the White House, who helped Ronald Reagan march to the head of the Republican Party, beneath a banner stitched in part by Walter Knott. But he felt he had more to give than money. Knott was a self-proclaimed fanatic for patriotism. His modest house was stuffed with the stuff of the patriot. Flags and eagles, busts of presidents, paintings, portraits. He loved all of it. He drew inspiration from all of it. He couldn't get enough. So Walter Knott, built his own Independence Hall. The original, in Philadelphia, was, and still is, a huge tourist attraction, where folks flocked to see the place where the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution were debated and signed. Why should folks out west have to make some arduous pilgrimage to commune with the spirits of the founders? So up it went, across the street from his restaurant and his amusement park. He cut the ribbon in 66, on the 4th of July, of course, It was a brick-for-brick reproduction, save for a small lecture hall upstairs and a fire exit in the back to conform to local building codes, a concession to the same sort of cruel suppression of liberty he was trying to counteract with the project in the first place. Opening day had little girls in period costumes passing out programs, Boy Scouts, and a choir, and pealing bells and patriotic songs and prayers that rang out to warn those who would restrict a man's freedom to opt out of paying social security payroll taxes or make baby blankets that catch on fire or refuse service to people based on the color of their skin or or build exact replicas of 18th century buildings using 20th century safety standards. Knott's idea was that people would come from all over. They'd walk the halls. They'd stand in the very room or a room that looked just like the very room, where Jefferson and Franklin and Hamilton and the like had figured it all out. They would listen to a recording of voice actors debating as they once did right there, or in a place that looked just like right there, but was right there in Orange County. School groups would come. Kids would be inspired. They'd grow up better than those young people protesting the war, marching for civil rights. They'd grow up right and respectful, They wouldn't be entitled or lazy. They'd believe in freedom and free enterprise. Better than the hippies, the place was suddenly crawling with hippies. Not even started charging admission in 68 to try to keep out the hippies. And associated pinkos. His Independence Hall wouldn't be a tourist attraction. It would be an antidote. Because Walter not figured, how could you leave that shrine to freedom without coming away with Walter Knott's exact ideas about freedom? How could you listen to the Founding Fathers, 
Voice actors portraying the Founding Fathers, sure, but these were good actors, engaged in a spirited debate about how best to craft a system that would allow for spirited debate and pluralism and free expression and differing opinions and differing ways of living and not come away with Walter Knott's exact